There are free parts to any redemption arc, which funnily enough follow the classic free act structure. Part 1 is the parallel to Act 1, establishing status quo. Establishing how your villain is actually a villain. This part is important, because if your villain isn't particularly villainous, there's not really anything to redeem in this arc, and the whole thing will ring pretty hollow. Part 2 is a lot more significant, the parallel to Act 2, the inciting incident. What that translates to in a redemption arc is the process of the character realizing that they are a villain and wanting to change. This doesn't have to be just a singular moment, in fact a lot of redemption arcs fall down due to lack of detail on this portion. Just flipping a switch between being a mustache twirling villain and wanting to repent for your sins is pretty unrealistic. You can break suspension of disbelief hard. Part 3 is the parallel to Act 3, the climax. In this case, the actually fucking redeeming yourself. This is the part where the character tries to right their behavior and be a good person going forward. They may or may not have to do something to make amends for the bad stuff they already did, depending on how heinous that was to begin with. Someone who was just an asshat can get away with merely changing their attitude. Someone who actively engaged in genocide cannot. If you end up shortchanging this section, it can end most disastrously of all, with the audience blown away with how easily forgiven the character is, even if the other characters didn't forgive them. Since a completed redemption arc is pretty much a statement on the part of the work that the character should be forgiven by the audience. You can even have them do enough to redeem themselves and still shortchange them if not given enough time, since redemption equals death is a thing, and it often comes off as just tired or a cop out. I don't know about you, but I would personally prefer to see my redeemed villains actually work to become good people, rather than just be shuffled out of the way by one single suicidal act. Now that I've established the criterion for a good redemption arc, I can get down to addressing the clickbaity title of the video. In case you clicked on this video not knowing, Peridot is a character from the 2010's cartoon Steven Universe, and in this video essay I will be establishing blah blah blah, you get it, let's get into this. Let's start with part one, establishing villainy. Peridot is introduced to the show as a bit of a shot to the head, the second gem we see outside the main three, and the first one to have travelled to Earth since travel between Earth and their homeworld was cut off thousands of years ago. Her debut episode actually does a pretty good job of establishing how bad news her arrival is by the Crystal Gem's reaction to her showing up. Steven is curious, but the other three freak the fuck out. She's established as far more technically advanced than the other gems, which is a nice touch of an ancient technologically advanced empire actually advancing in the thousands of years since they left their techno crap on Earth, and kinda cold, destroying a damaged robot she controls which she'd previously been using to repair the portal to Earth. She makes a few dry scientific log notes and leaves, leaving the audience to wonder who the fuck she is and what the fuck she was doing there. After that, she shows up much later, having sent an even bigger robot to access something deep within the Earth, activating some kind of old facility left on Earth by the homeworld gems before they fled. She actually communicates with Steven in this one, who manages to go against the other crystal gems' wishes and tries to talk things out with her. It fails. But she seems a lot more confused by his and the Crystal Gem's presence than anything. After that, she returns to Earth the hard way, in a big ol' spacefaring hand ship, along with an escort, Jasper, a massive brute who really dominates the two-part season finale. It's really not about Peridot in this ep. The two important things to note are that her escort gets incapacitated, and the ship goes down, stranding Peridot on Earth. It's after that that she becomes a much more active antagonist to the gems. At this point in the story, Peridot is at large on Earth and desperately trying to escape. The protagonists need to stop this, because if she does leave, she's bringing an army back with her. I've heard her situation summed up pretty well like this. Imagine you're an office worker, and one day you're told to go check up on an old project in an abandoned part of the office. When you get there, it's overgrown, and there's this tribe of office workers who've gone native and don't want to let you leave. That's a pretty good summary of where Peridot is at this point. It's around this time that Peridot is at her most villainous, fighting the gems, attempting to escape back to homeworld even though that would assuredly be bad news for Earth, and she even manages to trap Pearl and Garnet in a death trap once she figures she can't leave without them stopping her. But this is still tempered by the fact that she's scared, desperate, and indoctrinated to believe that what she's doing is right. It's important to note that one should be careful not to make a villain slated for redemption too villainous, or no one will buy it. The weight of redemptive actions should at least be equal to the weight of the villainous ones. As is often the case for redeemed characters, the first stage of her arc isn't even focused on her. Peridot being on the loose is the main thrust of this part of the show, but really the focus is on the Crystal Gems and their relationships with one another. Eventually, an emotional arc between Garnet and Pearl is finished, and as a narrative reward, they manage to capture Peridot, relieving her of her cybernetic enhancements and keeping her captive in Steven's house. This is where part 2 starts to come in. 
Stephen prefers to treat Peridot more as a guest than a prisoner, since she's essentially harmless at this point if her cybernetic Luminhance is tossed away, and comforts and informs her about life on Earth, enough to get her to spill the beans on her mission. Before the gems left Earth, they planted a massive conglomerate of broken gems in the mantle of the planet, which, when it wakes up, will destroy the entire thing. Since it is now obvious no one is coming to rescue her, she divulges this info to the Crystal Gems so they can work together to stop them all from becoming space dust. Along the way, Peridot learns to respect the other members of the Crystal Gems, despite being standoffish to all of them initially, so they each represent something Homeworld looks down on and rejects completely. She initially condescends Pearl for breaking away from the tasks usually associated with her caste and comes to respect her as an equal mind. She becomes a friend to Amethyst, despite her being considered malformed and inadequate for one of her kind, and even manages to respect Garnet for trying to support Peridot despite all her hatred for everything the Crystal Gems do, even though Garnet is a mixed fusion between two disparate castes herself, absolute anathema to the homeworld way. The great thing about this part too is that Peridot doesn't miraculously suddenly just figure out she's been a pawn of an oppressive regime. She slowly and realistically comes to know and respect these supposed adversaries of hers. And even though she was all set to hate them and everything they stand for, she really ends up gaining an appreciation for it, underneath her arrogance and callousness. Her progress is understated, to the point where when she seemingly betrays them all, you still think there's a chance that the show is headed in that direction. But as you probably guessed from the title of this video, or just having already watched Steven Universe, she doesn't betray them at all. Yeah, what kind of redemption arc would have the character betray the protagonist part way through, after it looked like they were going to join up with them full time? Even though Peridot was sneaking off to contact her overlord Yellow Diamond, she wasn't ratting the Crystal Gems out. Instead, she was petitioning for Yellow Diamond to spare the Earth, claiming that there are valuable resources there that would be irrevocably lost if it was simply obliterated, which she genuinely believes. At this point, she has reached something of a synthesis between her old worldview and that of the Crystal Gems, believing her totalitarian government to be merely misinformed about what the Earth has to offer. Of course, she's wrong, and is told so by Yellow Diamond herself, who believes completely in what the Gem Empire is doing, and isn't going to be dissuaded of this by a mere Peridot. Peridot becomes flustered at the complete disconnect between what she thought was a genius, impossibly perfect being, and this demonstration of what she knows to be total stupidity and pig-headedness, which causes her to mouth Yellow Diamond off, and officially cement herself as a Crystal Gem. After this, the mission to defeat the World Shattering Cluster begins, with Steven and Peridot drilling into the Earth's mantle in a machine they'd all been working on to try and stop it. Peridot doesn't really do a lot to help in this endeavor, though when they look like they're going to die, she does genuinely say she's sorry she couldn't save Steven, a far cry from the seemingly emotionless pawn of the diamonds which she was to start with. The fact that this is done while she seemingly has no chance to survive is a great way to show that, no, there is no guile or pretense. This is what the character actually thinks. After that entire... arc? Fuck, I'm getting tired of saying that word. Wraps up, we get more from Peridot's redemption in the form of Lapis Lazuli, a character who had previously been kidnapped by Homeworld and sent back to Earth against her will, simply to verify that there were gems there and that they got the right ones when they came smashing in with a handship. Remember the handship? Damn, that was a long time ago in this script. Anyhow, she's still stranded on Earth, and Steven seems to think that she'll make a good roomie for Peridot. To make Lapis' long story short, she had been imprisoned in a mirror since the war, and has a real chip on her shoulder about being imprisoned. Kinda like she was by Peridot, even if it wasn't her doing specifically. She was the one with the leash. We kinda didn't see a lot of this dynamic outside of one scene during that episode, and it kinda does a disservice to this episode because we just saw Peridot do a bunch of redemption stuff and become a totally different person from who she was then. So Lapis getting mad at her seems unreasonable to the audience, even if it really isn't. Peridot goes for a lot to overcome Lapis's initial hatred for her, for seemingly no reason but that Steven seemed to think it was a good idea for the two to live together. And along the way, Peridot does a lot of thinking things through from Lapis's perspective, trying numerous things she thinks would be helpful to Lapis to allow her to adjust on Earth. In the end, she makes a sincere connection to Lapis, and the two remain best friends throughout the series. The final part of what I would call the Peridot Redemption arc is a relatively simple and seemingly filler God, I hate that word when referring to Steven Universe episodes episode in which Peridot gets given a tablet that can kind of replicate some of the functions of her old cybernetic enhancements. Then she, Steven, and Amethyst go to a theme park where Peridot gets upset her physical short and stubbiness and peds her fun. She gets depressed over it and Steven confronts her about it, but all she wants to do is put out angry tweets on the tablet. 
Eventually, this comes to a head with Amethyst threatening to throw the device away and Peridot blurting out that it's all she is, a reference to her being an Era 2 Peridot, apparently made under resource crunch without a lot of the standard gym features. And she feels pretty lousy about that, despite Amethyst telling her she doesn't need to hold herself to those standards. The episode ends when Amethyst throws the device in the ocean and Peridot holds it back using her ability to manipulate metal, an ability she didn't even know she had until just then. See, it's a metaphor. If she'd keep focusing on how she can't do standard gym abilities like her peers, she'd have never found out that she has abilities just as good, if not better, than they do. This kind of draws the Peridot Redemption arc to a close, since it's a moment signifying Peridot isn't just okay with others being outside the mold of what a gym is supposed to be, but she's at peace with herself as well. She's gone from a judgmental asshole to someone who is accepting of, and even kind of friendly at times to others, and she's worked hard to put those ideals into practice, which has earned her some measure of forgiveness from the people she's wronged. And that's about it for Peridot. She is a recurring character from that point on, but there's not a lot of focus on it from then and her redemption is pretty much done. The good thing is, she continues to be around, reminding the audience that she wasn't just there for that arc, that once someone has changed their ways, that's not the end of everything there is to say about them, which I find happens a surprising amount, much like how media seems to think that once a character gets into a relationship, that's all there is to say about that relationship. It's really uncreative and insulting, and frankly kind of trivializes the whole damn thing. But I guess in conclusion, to break a rule that every high school English teacher will tell you, even though arguing that Paradox Redemption Arc is the best one, Fight Me, was mostly there to be a clickbaity title, and I used a particular storyline as a positive example to explore the Redemption Arc trope, I still do believe that particular statement. What elevates it, other than the incredibly good show it takes place in, seriously, watch Steven Universe, and the fact that it, for my money, takes place in the best part of that show, is that it's a very gradual process, one which never takes things a step further than is reasonable at the time and which isn't even really focused on that hard for a lot of it, making it a far more natural fit. And I guess because I love Peridot so much, I didn't mention it during this review because it wasn't relevant, but I adore and relate to this overly egotistical, socially inept nerd. She's basically a delight every moment she's on screen. Totally unscientific, I know, but that's opinions for you. I've justified it about as well as I can. And this is not to say there aren't a lot of redemption arcs that come incredibly close. It's a trope I like a lot. And yes, I am referring to that one you're probably thinking of. That one was great too, don't get me wrong, but fuck if this video didn't balloon way out of proportion for how long a person's first video essay ever should be. So I'm not gonna go into more detail, though I guess if anyone asks, I might go and do another video on this topic, it kinda goofus to go with Peridot's gallant here. God knows, there are plenty of examples to choose from. Okay. That's uh, basically the end of the scripted part of the video, as you can probably tell. This part is now unscripted. Uh, this video took a long-ass time for me to make, a lot longer than I thought, about twice as long at least. And it, This is just the first video I've made like this. I'm probably going to make a few more. I actually had quite a bit of fun with it at the end there, and I know more about what to do now in the editing process to make it a little less uh, trash. Uh, I know it's pretty trash now, but uh, if you did like it, uh, leave, uh, leave a like in the thing. If you didn't like it, leave, leave a dislike, because the algorithm uh, thinks they're both the same thing, and you'll only give me more power. So uh, feel free to do that. Leave a comment saying why I am or am not completely fucking full of shit, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll see you in my next shitty hot take video. Bye bye